FM. Isha Leadership Academy presents Isha Insight, the DNA of success. Insight, the DNA of success, a four-day business leadership intensive was held recently at the Isha Yoga Center in Coimbatore. Conducted by the Isha Leadership Academy, Insight offered participants a rare chance to interact with successful industry leaders and learn the secret of success from their professional and personal lives. A galaxy of resource leaders with over 500 years of cumulative industry experience offered consultation to the participants on specific challenges in their respective businesses. The picturesque and tranquil, yet high-powered ambience of the Isha Yoga Center, combined with Sadhguru's intuitive process on creating a pure inner balance, made Insight a truly unique leadership program. In the making of a business, the people involved are most important particularly the leadership. What kind of leadership? When we say leadership, essentially we are talking about how many people can you take in one direction towards one purpose to achieve that one thing that we want to do? Can you inspire only your family members as many people are operating? Or can you inspire a larger community? Or can you inspire people from everywhere to make this happen, whatever the intent is? Or people gather around you only because it's their livelihood. It's a big difference. If people are around you only for livelihood, you have to operate with carrot and stick policy that in my understanding is not enterprise nor management, it's a kind of slave management. Show them this, they may run, if they get tired then beat them, threaten them, you will fire them <laughs> and keep them going. In this sense, conducting a business can become a great misery if we run businesses like this. Or another level, Managing a business means managing a hundred minds or a thousand minds or a ten thousand minds around you. If you want to manage these thousand minds, first thing is, are you able to manage this one, yours? If yours is not well managed, how do you manage all these minds? Then again it will be a very stressful process because you cannot manage this one mind which is in your hand but you are trying to manage other people's minds, which is definitely not in your hands, and this will drive you crazy. There is substantial medical and scientific evidence that only when you are in a pleasant state of experience, your body and your brain will function at its best. If you want to be successful, fundamentally, you have to harness the prowess of your body, the intelligence of your mind and the resources around you. This is all success is, isn't it? Hello? Tell me in what order it should come. First, resources outside. First this one, isn't it? You are able to harness the capabilities of your physiology and your psychological structure, only then you harness the world around you. I grew up in India, I went to the US for a few years uh, and I decided I worked there with some financial services organization, you know typical Goldman Sachs, you work with the financial services companies in Wall Street and you're very excited, except it wasn't exciting for me uh, and I just felt the whole idea of making money from money, at least for me was not the most exciting idea and I said, you know, I want to be able to come back to India and some way be able to give back to my country. When I came back, what I noticed was that while we had 
you know, some hospitals, healthcare was not really standardized and it wasn't really branded. So as a patient, when you walk into any hospital or even a path lab at that time, the experience, was it was really bad. And it was a feeling that it's not safe, it's not hygienic, it's not clean, and I don't know if I can trust the result that's going to come from it. And that was the emotion that I picked up. And I said, you know, what if I could build a chain of labs that people really trust, where they knew when they walked in that they were going to get a standardized service. They knew they were going to be treated well, with empathy, with love, with kindness. And they knew when they left that they were going to get a 100% correct report. And how great would that be? And that was how the idea of Metropolis really emerged. Along the way, in, in 2006, so from 2001, you know, I kept building this, expanding across different cities, started with Chennai, went to Kerala, went to Karnataka, went growing all over. We got our first international opportunity in 2005, and we entered Sri Lanka uh, based on that. Um, you know, we had some partners who approached us, who said they were interested in working with us, and we, we sort of got in. 2006 uh, got into Middle East, 2007 into South Africa. And all this, while it sounds very exciting, I can tell you all three were mistakes, right? And that's the reason I'm bringing it up. Because what I realize in hindsight, that while it seems very exciting to be growing all over the world and to be in you know, lots of different places and feeling like, wow, we've become a multinational company and we feel so good and our image will be better, the truth is that when you're a small company who's trying to grow, the bandwidth that you need to manage remote places, new cultures, new taxation, new legislation, new governance, new way of working, is a completely different bandwidth than we actually had. So even though we did the deals, we actually weren't able to be successful in them, as successful as we wanted in them, because we didn't have the bandwidth to be able to deliver well in those countries. That was the first reason. The second reason was that we actually, while we were expanding all different places, we were leaving our home ground open for competitors to come in. So because we hadn't really consolidated our base in Bombay, you know, uh, we, had, we had a few centers, we had maybe 10, 15 centers, but nothing like what we should have had to dominate Bombay. That was the second mistake. Um, and I can tell you the third mistake that I made along the way was as entrepreneurs, you know, we are all so used to being the whole and soul of the company, doing everything. You know, we are the paper pushers, we are the guys with the government, we are the finance people, we will manage the logistics. If some shipment has not gone, we'll jump in and manage the shipment. We are so used to it, to fixing everything and being there for everything, that I think often we don't realize our own inherent weaknesses or what we're not able to do. And I think not getting a super quality team very early in my company was my, probably my biggest mistake to date. I fixed it now, but it, I've done it seven years too late. A lot of the time people ask me, what would you do differently? The truth is the one thing if I could do differently would be to hire and build that really high quality team very early on, which would have allowed the organization to grow much further by today. Thank you very much. Amira, that was wonderful. Thank you, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Amira. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Isha Leadership Academy presents Isha Insight, the DNA of success. The attitude was that I'm not going to give up and we, will go, we are going to make it happen in the infrastructure sector because infrastructure was that, that time the domain of the government. So everything in infrastructure had to happen with the government. We started with, a, with something which was a little different. We created a niche for ourselves. We started with financing of construction equipments. Now that particular time in 89, the sale of construction equipment in the country was only 80 to 100 crore rupees. Because all the contractors, they used to use manual workers were there. All the jobs were done manually. So workers were there working on the projects. So we, start, we tied up with LNT and we started going to the, man, to the contractor and marketing to them that you see here, you take this equipment and you will be in a position to do your job which is going to take you four years within one year and this is the return that you have. So with a lot of trepidation, people did take the financing and we used to charge 36% interest. We used to pay 19% to the bankers because the bankers didn't want to lend and we used to charge 36% and still the contractors were making so much money because of mechanization they were in a position to pay back the entire loan within one year. So that was their profitability. 
And that's how the whole, uh, you know, the entire landscape in the country on infrastructure started changing. Valley for Rivers has become a phenomenon. Over 160 million people participating in an event has never happened before. And across the country, the necessary awareness has happened. Above all, political parties, a whole spectrum of them, have participated in the event and assured their support. Now the state governments have taken it up very aggressively. Right now we are focused on creating necessary legal and legislative structures so that this will become an implementable policy for the future. When Sadhguru revealed this plan to all of us, right after Mahashivratri, the biggest Mahashivratri in the history of Isha just got over, and after that we were getting into our grooves or going back into the regions, conducting the programs, and that's when Sadhguru set this target and said this has to happen. And this is not something just to do a rally, this is something that has to move the nation and, a, and if the rivers have to flow, this is not just a three months project, this is a 30 years project. And in our minds, suddenly what we thought as peak has just shattered. And in our minds, what was possible, what was not possible just completely vanished and we had to just do whatever was needed here. If it meant, meant giving our lives, giving everything, to make it happen, we had to do it. When the rally began, uh, I think uh, my first uh, thought was that because we are present in Tamil Nadu and we have done a lot of grassroots work in Tamil Nadu, we will see a lot of mass support. Uh, but as we go outside of Tamil Nadu and perhaps once we cross southern India, it would pretty much be limited to uh, the events that were planned. But what happened was pretty much the opposite. Of course, we saw a lot of, as Sadhguru was driving through the states, and I was there, uh, you know, taking care of Sadhguru's office, so uh, traveling through the entire rally. The kind of people that gathered on the streets, outside, not just of Tamil Nadu, not just outside of South India, was incredible. And they didn't perhaps understand the language that, you know, was being spoken, though Sadhguru tried his best and he picked up a lot of Hindi along the way. But the way people responded to him was, was phenomenal. And it just, the whole movement just snowballed to the extent that we ended up doing not 23, but 146 events during the course of the day. Isha Leadership Academy presents Isha Insight, the DNA of success. The most important part of entrepreneurship is to really make sure that you have a very deep sense of purpose and passion in that business that you're going to start. Mm. And so when I started my business really accidentally, I think I, I went about it with a lot of commitment, passion um, and, and, and involvement uh, because I was determined to make it succeed. I think all entrepreneurs want their businesses to succeed. So I think that passion and commitment actually gets you to focus on that success. And I think that's what made me realize that this is what entrepreneurship is about. You got into the enzyme business, which required uh, you know, sterile, very high quality water, uninterruptible power supply, very high level of skills. None of the skills were available in India. None of these resources were available in India at that time. So what, what were you thinking? I think I would call it foolish courage. <laughs> and I think every entrepreneur does have foolish courage because that's how you start your business, thinking you can make a success despite all odds, okay? Mm. And we had plenty of those odds. But I think, uh, you know, when you, when you embark on a journey, you become very resourceful. You make do with what's available, but we tried and tested stuff and made sure it worked conceptually. And then we basically started basically scaling up our technology. And I can tell you it wasn't funny because nobody would believe that such technologies could be scaled up. <laughs> so I couldn't get anyone to fund me in scaling up that technology. Finally, just to cut the long story short, just a year later, my Irish partners got acquired by Unilever mm -hmm. and I suddenly had this gigantic 
multinational company as my partners, and they realized that this was really, really pro unique technology. So I think, you know, it made me realize for the first time what was value creation all about in our kind of business. You know, science and technology we keep talking about, but when you innovate, you create huge value. And when you create very, very proprietary kind of innovations, it creates even higher value. And that's what I learned. I mean, that's the, that was my Eureka moment. Over the years, I started looking at the technologies that we had developed for enzymes. And I said to myself, what else can we do with these technologies? And what else happened to be biopharmaceuticals? And when I looked at biopharmaceuticals, the reason I got very driven by biopharmaceuticals is because I realized that India simply could not afford biopharmaceuticals at that stage, yeah. in, 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 at the early part of, the, mm -hmm. this, uh, of 2000. We were at the epicenter of diabetes, and there were a large number of insulin-dependent patients, diabetics in our country, and to think that we were importing all our insulin mm -hmm. didn't make sense. And I said, why can't we make insulin and see if we can bring down the cost? So my mantra became, let's try and embark on a mission to provide affordable access to these very expensive biopharmaceuticals, like mm -hmm. insulins. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it went on to cancer drugs, like biologics, which were antibodies, which were, again, each uh, treatment used to cost something like 20 lakhs, <laughs> which nobody could afford. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I'm very pleased that over time, our, my team of scientists and researchers, we've brought down the prices of all these life-saving biopharmaceuticals to a tenth or even a fifth of what they are, even today. Mm. Okay? There are lots of people, okay, like us who have reached 50, 55, 60, have decided to give back in form of mentoring. They don't know how to access them. Isha is a very good place. This inside is a great place for 200 people sitting with 226 leaders. And if you actually connect with one leader and, and over the next six months, one year, actually take his help and mentorship and it comes free because it's all in, in the sharing back and giving back mode. I think it's probably the only program which, which combines the, uh, the matter and the self so beautifully. Otherwise, we are either discussing very business conferences or we are going to spiritual programs. There is hardly any program where someone helps you to transform yourself and then your business. So it's both are linked. In the three days, we used to end our lunch session or start any session with a dance. Uh, uh, to the kind of bonding we have, it's unbelievable. So that's what makes it special, matter and self both together. While I've attended numerous development programs, but this is truly transformational. It focuses on the, uh, the management philosophies which are seeped in our Indian thinking, in our Indian value system, which are just not focusing on just the business aspect, because as an individual, you're a whole. Uh, there is the entire ecosystem that has to work. So it is the business, it is you as an individual, the people and the employees that are there that you impact, the communities that you impact. So it covers all aspects and it's a holistic program. My biggest takeaway is that I will go back and tell my business, my managers, my, uh, my HODs, my team, my supervisors, uh, people down below that this is what we are going to achieve as a business and this is the end result and you are all contributing towards this. I think that would make a big shift in the, in the, uh, in the individuals uh, taking the ownership of what they're doing, uh, getting associated more with the company and I think that will make the whole ecosystem much positive. I think some of the big learnings have been invest in your employees. Uh, how do you make them professional entrepreneurs even though they are employees? How do you give them problems, not tasks? And so that has been a really important factor towards scale. Because if you want to scale rapidly, you need these guys to take ownership and move to the next level. Last three days, I mean, we've been singing and dancing. We've had uh, resource leaders. Uh, we've had some very good keynote speakers. I think the way the whole uh, program was organized in terms of uh, sessions, in terms of the approach uh, to bring out 
and to enable us to really bring about our problems or questions that we are seeking answers for and then the three days being organized in such a way that we actually get the solutions that we are looking for from within ourselves rather than having somebody put that up on board. Isha Leadership Academy presents Isha Insight, the DNA of success. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.